Okay. Hey, everybody. This is Andrew Jones. I'm the co-founder and co-director of Climate Interactive, and I'm here with Dr. Sibel Ecker and a number of people from our Climate Interactive team in this webinar that's going to look at the new recent feature that we just added to En-ROADS, exploring both quantifying the economic impact of climate change, but also exploring how that impact could feed back to affect economic growth, which of course, of course affects temperature, which affects impacts, which affects economic growth in a big balancing feedback loop. We'll be looking at both of those things in this webinar. Of course, En-ROADS is the simulator that we at Climate Interactive is building with our close partners at MIT Sloan Sustainability Initiative. And I wanted to pass it over to John to welcome everybody. John Sturman, who is a professor we work closely with at MIT and is one of the creators of the simulator and the whole science of engaging people with games and interactive workshops. So John, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Drew, and welcome everybody. It's great to have so many of you here and eager to learn about how we're continually improving the En-ROADS Climate Policy Simulator. So as Drew mentioned, we've been working hard with Sibel and Lori and many other members of the team to incorporate what's called the climate damage or economic damage function. And this is so important, you're gonna hear about the details, but the reason it's terribly important is that it's why we're doing this. You know, people often talk about saving the planet, and that's shorthand for what's really important, which is saving humans. And climate change hurts our lives, our health, and our prosperity. And we need to know how much and what we can do to mitigate those risks. This is a very contentious issue in economics, climate modeling, and climate science. And so for a long time, we avoided putting it into the model, but we can't do that anymore. So what we've done, largely with uh, Sibel's fantastic help, is surveyed all the literature that's out there. Who has studied the impacts that global warming and climate change would have on our prosperity and our health and our lives? Um, and what we're gonna be sharing with you today is how we've incorporated the impact on prosperity, GDP. We're not yet at the point where we can credibly and in a grounded scientific way incorporate the impact on population, but I expect that as scientific understanding of that issue grows, we will be tackling that one as well. But it matters a lot what happens to the economy. Billions of people in the world are still struggling to rise out of poverty and if climate change is going to stop that, thwart it, slow it down, we need to capture that somehow in the model. So that's what we've done. And as you'll see, the uh, scientific community does not agree on what the impact of different amounts of warming might be on global economic output. So what we've done is we've enabled you to choose from any of the credible studies and use their assumptions or try your own assumptions, which is of course the fundamental philosophy behind En-ROADS. You need to be able to try your beliefs and your assumptions and pick the sliders and the policies you wanna try because that's the way people learn. So with Great. that, thank you again. Drew, back over to you. All right, thanks, thanks. All right, so let's dig in. As John mentioned, the headlines the motivator here are these headlines you keep seeing daily, it feels like, in, in the news and the media. In this one, UN urges nations to scale up cha climate change adaptation to avoid major economic loss. Climate change to slow global economic growth, a new study finds. Day-to-day -day temperature variability reduces economic growth. Maybe it would cost the world $7.9 trillion by 2050. Can we quantify what that cost is going to be using En-ROADS. But also, you see a number like that, 7.9, it's going to, that's a prediction, but we can avoid much of that 7.9, possibly. How would we? That's, of course, what En-ROADS does, is allow you to change the future, not just accept the future. Don't just accept the 7.9 trillion. Um, 
but we're getting into the numbers and there's a lot about economics, but I just wanna take a little bit of a step back as human beings about what this means to us and what are the impacts that actually concern you. Uh, let's not just think about this as a question of dollars, but instead, let's think about the kinds of things that uh, matter to you. So please go to Poll Everywhere, numbers aside, what are the examples of impacts on people, on other species, uh, via particular processes in the world, parts of the world, a city, a state, a, a loss of habitat. Thank you, someone just wrote in. What are the examples? Someone showed food security. We're concerned about the effect of drought on yields of crops around the world, food security, loss of species, loss of Arctic ecosystems, habitat, desertification, flooding, increased inequality, absolutely. Wildfires devastating California has happened. It could happen in the future. Infectious disease and vectors, climate refugees, people moving because of those ecological changes, natural communities and biodiversity, flooding, someone's writing in, thank you. Loss of biodiversity, impact on wilderness areas, loss of species. So not just humans, but other species around the world. Health, overall health. Coastal flooding, sea level rise, drought, water access. Climate impacts are the tipping point that drives displacement and migration, floods, damaging floods. Okay, you really get it. This is really helpful to see. The flooding for those who cannot move easily be and are displaced, global tipping points, health concerns. Tipping points, of course, are processes that self-reinforce over time. Impacts of health on people who live in regions that are already too hot, loss of natural beauty, climate refugees, impact on frontline communities, thank you. Children in countries that contributed nothing to this problem. Intergenerational justice here. Conflict due to water and food shortages. Pronounced impact on the most vulnerable. Okay, this is fantastic. I think we've covered the, the suite of things. Please keep writing. We're, we capture all that you've coming up with. And I just wanna note that like, the second motivator, one motivator is this. Can we quantify these impacts? The second, it comes out of sitting with the model and looking at some of the graphs. And we had a meeting with a fairly prominent US political leader um, who looked at our model, looked at some of the trends, and looked at not exactly these two graphs, but something close to these two graphs at the same time, and said, wait a second. And look at these graphs with me for a second. And for those who are new to En-ROADS, of course, this is the En-ROADS interface. And what it's doing is presenting two graphs, playing out a scenario into the future. This happens to be our baseline future. What this model allows you to do is to make changes such as setting a carbon price and then very quickly seeing what the result would be if we set a certain policy playing out into the future. We'll dig more into it in a minute. For now, I just wanna show you this one set of graphs. So let's just look at these two graphs. On the right, here is the baseline scenario we have for sea level rise. Sea level rise going up, 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 crossing one meter. And the impacts that that might have, he was imagining in Shanghai, Alexandria, uh, Egypt, in London, in New York City, in Bangladesh, around the world, in uh, Thailand and Bangkok. All those impacts, growing and growing and growing, and at the same time, look over on the left, gross world product. This is GDP, economic goods and services activity, growing unchanged despite this sea level rise. And mind you, it's not just sea level rise, it is also the other things you just mentioned. Can we really imagine that these two things could happen at the same time? And he was saying, that's not gonna happen. So. It was the motivator, as John mentioned, for us to think, how would the graph on the right and other impacts of climate change feed back to affect the graph on the left? How would it change future economic growth? That was the second motivator for this work. Okay, so if those are the two motivations, how do we tackle this using system dynamics? With system dynamics, we don't just react to those headlines that you saw. Oh, it's gonna be $7.9 trillion by 2050. 
or we don't even react just to the patterns of behavior underneath and anticipate things where we can be adaptive and proactive. We want to be at the bottom of the iceberg. What is the systemic structure? What is the feedback structure? What are the accumulations of stock and flow dynamics that we should be considering as we think about how to address this and change its long-term behavior? So with systemic structure, well, first of all, let's go with the trends halfway down, like the it's the middle part of that iceberg. Some of the trends that we're seeing, this is from 1980 to 2019, here just in the United States, the number of billion dollar disasters in different categories. And just for now, just squint your eyes at it and you can see the number of billion dollar disasters is growing. We look at the trend, see that trend that's growing. We also can see the cost, the increasing cost of storms in the US, 1980 to 2019 here growing over time. And not smoothly, 2011 was a particularly high year, but over time, the trend of having them growing. Globally, the soaring cost of climate change, said Forbes, 1990 to 2016, all the different number of events and then the growing cost of those events. So we don't just look at the headlines, we don't just look at the trends, now we wanna look at the systemic structure underneath. So here is the systemic structure of one of the causal chains in En-ROADS, particularly before we added this feedback effect. And one way to look at it was we had growing GDP, that drives more energy demand, more goods and services require energy. And by the way, there's an arrow, and then there's a plus next to the arrow. The plus means these two variables change in the same direction. So more energy demand, more burning of coal, oil, and gas, more emitting of methane and nitrous oxide F gases. So more energy demand, more burning of coal, oil, and gas, therefore more greenhouse gas emissions, increasing concentrations, that is the amount in the atmosphere, CO2 in the atmosphere, but also methane and F gases and nitrous oxide, leading to more increased temperature and also impacts. And just to show you, particularly for those who haven't seen En-ROADS much in the past, one can trace through that causal chain in the model. So let's look, I'm gonna go to my favorite graph is show miniature graphs right here. This is the top 12 graphs that you can look at. And actually, Caroline, can you just send this, send the model in chat. We just post the model in its uh, baseline run. So everyone, anyone wants to open it up, they can try it themselves. So let's play out that same chain in the model and just see what's there. Gross world product. So there's the graph, gross world product growing exponentially over time. We said that was gonna drive energy demand up. So I'm gonna pull up the next graph, energy demand. More people ask, we're demanding more energy. Notice it's not growing exponentially because we're factoring in improvements to the energy efficiency in transport and buildings and industry along the way. So it's not exponential, it's actually growing at a decreasing rate. More energy demand, where are they getting that energy? Well, what's relevant for climate is how much is coming from burning coal, oil, and gas. Those three factors or those three energy supplies are stacked on top of each other. Coal is in brown here, oil is in red, and gas is in blue. On top of it, renewables, biomass, and nuclear. So those emissions, and I'm gonna to go to a graph that I particularly like here, CO2 stacked. It shows you if those, that's the energy sources, these are the main carbon dioxide sources. Again, coal in brown, oil in red, gas in blue. Below it is the land use and deforestation emissions. On top of it, bioenergy emissions. So if you have all that CO2 going in the atmosphere, then over on the right is greenhouse gas net emissions. This adds in methane, and some of that's driven by the coal, excuse me, the oil and the gas leakage of methane. More of the emissions that leads to temperature going all the way up to 3.6 degrees C or 6.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's the causal story that you saw in that last diagram, playing it all the way out. One of the impacts that we have is sea level rise. We are working to quantify others. So that's how far we had gotten as of say two weeks ago. But what we're here to show you is the next step. And the next step is, as we were showing you before, the damage function. The damage function says that as impacts go up, 
then GDP would be lower. And there's a negative sign down there at the bottom. That means that change in the opposite direction. As impacts go up, GDP goes down. That is creating what we call a balancing loop. Balancing loop counteracts change. It is an alternative to a reinforcing loop that we've explored in other webinars. Remember the reinforcing loop of renewable energy growing and growing and growing, or the reinforcing loops of tipping points in the biogeochemical system that we're concerned about, like the albedo effect and others. This is a balancing loop that tends to counteract change, the damage function. It feels like this. It feels like where we sit as humanity making a change, growing our economy, but having that delayed, distant implications of our actions via these dominoes coming around, and we're starting, we have been feeling for the last 10, 20 years, some of those dominoes falling, triggered by actions that we've taken over many decades in the past. Okay, so if that's what we've just added, I want you to start thinking about the strength of that effect. So, Think hard, how strong do you think that effect would be? And I'm gonna pull up the next poll right here and ask you, so imagine how much do you think GDP is likely to be reduced below its baseline value when the temperature hits two degrees C? You're answering fast. Boy, this is great, people are on it. I wanted to go back and make sure I'm really clear about this, what I'm showing in the graph here. So you can keep answering, but imagine, what I'm asking is, this graph right now, GDP is just growing steadily. When temperature hits two degrees over time, how much lower do you think gross world product would be as a result, just as a result of the negative impacts of flooding desertification, wildfires, sea level rise, et cetera, and the resulting reinvestment of money. How much? So is it zero to five? Is it five to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 or more? So please write in the poll everywhere. Ignore the other people as much as you can. Try to make an independent assessment of this. We're very curious to see what you think the answer to this question is, because what we're going to do next is we're going to go and see what do scholars think from re when they uh, did their studies about what this impact would be. So what do you think? Right now, it's 10 to 20 is winning. 10 to 20 is winning. This is interesting. Uh, Sabella is going to show you the scholar's answer in a few minutes. 5 to 10 is in second, then 20 to 30. 2% of people think it's 40% or more. Very interesting to see. So five to 10 is catching up, but uh, right now 10 to 20 is the top vote getter. Okay, so we're gonna get to test this all in a minute, but just hold on to this for a second and notice where most people think that impact ought to be. 10 to 20 or five to 10 seem to be the top winners at this point. Okay. So I hope you're really, really curious what is going to be the, the answer from the world and then what would the implications be for future warming if there is that impact. So I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Sibel Ecker, who's sitting late night in Austria. She's actually uh, spent one day a week and connected to IASA there in Austria. And so Sibel, take it away and uh, show us what you've learned about how to model this. Hello everyone, so I'm Sibela Cash and I'm here in Austria indeed. Uh, so I'm here today actually to tell you a little bit, a little bit more about this near future on En-ROADS uh, from behind the scenes, from the modeling team. And we wanted to give this extra information because um, first of all we would like to be transparent. This is our general goal. We want you to know what makes up those numbers you see on the app in the NRO simulations. And we wanted to give this extra information because we have new user inputs on the app, we have new sliders, and we want to explain what they really mean so that you can build uh, better informed scenarios using NROs. 
So I will just start with the definition of damage function that Drew mentioned before. Um, so while estimating the economic impact of climate change, economists economists work with a notion called damage function. Damage function is simply defines the relationship between global mean temperature increase and the, and the economic loss, for example, reduction in GDP, global GDP. So if you imagine this relationship as a graph, you will have the temperature on the x-axis and you will have the damage uh, on the y-axis depending on temperature. And this damage is often expressed as a fraction of global GDP or global GDP per capita or even GDP growth rate, actually. Uh, the next slide, do you please? So this one, for instance, is the damage function William Nordhaus, the Nobel winning economist William Nordhaus used in one of his recent studies. He estimated that the damage will be relatively low at lower temperatures like 1.5 or 2 degree but it will increasingly increase as temperature increases to be more specific uh, i think yeah he estimated 2.1 percent loss uh, at three degrees and 8.5 percent loss at six degrees so how did we come up with such a smooth function uh, of damage or, or temperatures so what Nordhaus used and what many other economists use is something called enumerative approach. They collect point estimates from the scientific literature or by surveying other scientists, other economists uh, about the uh, damage at certain temperature values. For example, damage at two degrees will be 5%, at four degrees it will be 10%, etc. The points you see on that graph refer to these point estimates they collect. And each point estimate is an aggregation of expected damage in many, many different economic sectors you can imagine, like infrastructure, agricultural production or manufacturing. Then they fit a continuous function to these point estimates and come with what we call damage function as a smooth uh, as the smooth green line you see here. So this is one approach, but there are of course alternative approaches, for example, statistical approaches where they look at the past observations, uh, past relationship between the household income, for example, or national income and the temperature, and then they extrapolate this across space, across countries and time. Uh, a Stanford economist, Marshall Burke, for example, uh, led that kind of research and he is one of the, he created one of the functions we will show in a minute. So there are a variety of approaches and of course there is a lot of uncertainty about the future and this results in a variety of estimates for damage functions. So in this plot, the Damage function of North House, which we showed before, is the lowest line, for example, the orange line. So, and many other economists, prominent economists, estimated higher uh, damage functions, like Weizmann, uh, Marty Weizmann, or Nicholas Turk. Their estimates are still similar at lower temperatures, between 0 and 5 uh, percent, for example, at 2 degrees, but they follow a steeper curve steeper damage curve as damage increases. Some others, however, estimate higher damages even at low temperatures, like Marshall Burke and his colleagues, as I mentioned. They estimate the damage at two degrees will be around 13% of global GDP on average, and if they make different assumptions in their calculations, it may go up to 35%. So if we remember your estimates, your guesses about the damage. Uh, I think it was very interesting. You have, uh, I think the response is more or less equal between 5 to 10 or 10 to 20 percent. So I think we can say that this is, uh, I, uh, I don't want to say it's around the same range because zero, zero, between 0 and 5 is one of the major estimates economists have, but I think your responses are pretty close. And what else is interesting, 
I think this group, we had another webinar in the morning. Your estimates are relatively higher than them. So I yeah. think we have a more pessimistic audience uh, today. <laughs> <in the afternoon. laughs> uh, so let's get back to En-ROADS. In En-ROADS, there are two new sliders with which you can define your own damage function. So you can define this relationship between GDP loss and temperature. The first slider asks you your estimate for the reduction in GDP at two degrees. And with that, you define, you specify one point on the damage function, for example, 15% at two degrees. The next slider asks you the maximum reduction in GDP that you imagine to be possible. With that, uh, you set a limit, you upper limit, you set a cap on the damage function that you estimate. So then, uh, I call this a magic, and magic occurs, and the uh, En-ROADS defines a continuous function for you for these two, two inputs. We need these two function. Uh, we need this continuous function because you know En-ROADS is a dynamic simulation. It calculates the damage, temperature, and all other things uh, for hundreds of years. Therefore, we need to know what the damage estimate is at every temperature that results from uh, anthropogenic actions and emissions. And to, to give a bit of a flavor of the math behind it, so this is the math that creates this magic and uh, the continuous function. Your inputs from these two, two sliders go into this function and uh, used by NOT. So I will not go into detail of this more, uh, longer, but you can go to our reference guide, uh, which is online and available to everyone, and read more about this damage function and the uh, scientific literature damage estimates in the scientific literature that I referred to a couple of minutes ago. So and I Caroline, well, excuse me, Sabel, Caroline, can you post the link to the reference guide and into chat, and people can open up the reference guide and go to look to page 360 if you're interested in reading all the equations. Uh, so look to the chat if you're interested. Please go ahead, Sabel. Uh, thanks to you. So actually, no, I won't go ahead. That's all from me. Uh, so let us know if you have questions. Uh, and now Drew will uh, walk you through the app, the, this, this new feature right. and the simulation results. Thank you. Great. All right, thank you, Sabelle. And I'm just gonna pause for just a second. Um, anyone looking at the questions box on our team, was there a question that's come up that you think everybody would be curious about, particularly related to what Sabelle just went through um, or any of the foundations before I go ahead and show how it actually works in, in the simulator itself? Uh, any questions, and you don't need to, but um, this would be a moment when we could do that if it would help. I've just seen a couple of questions where I think a demo would actually help answer them. So, oh, great. So, All go right. Go for it. So, we're going to shift over to say, how do you use the simulator to experiment with your own assumptions for what the damage function should be? And also, how can you like pull in the academic studies and look at the kind of preset functions that are out there? So, where this hides is under simulation. Under assumptions, we have many of the assumptions that are critical to the behavior of the model that you can change. The bottom one here is the economic impact of climate change. And the first thing to do is to pick the graphs that most illuminate what's going on in the model. And I'm gonna pull up the one that you just saw from Sabel, reduction in GDP versus temperature. This is a very different graph. She showed you this before. It's not showing behavior over time. It's showing the relationship between temperature here at the bottom or x-axis to the reduction in GDP. The lines that exist here already are the academic studies that are out there you just heard Sabel talking about. Over on the left is the actual simulated global GDP, gross world product. And um, what we're gonna do is simulate what your inputs were I'm gonna go and look and remind myself what you came up with before. So most of you thought that the reduction should be 10 to 20%. So I'm gonna go here to 10 to 20% and let's try it and think about what that 
impact is going to be. Um, actually, but before I put in yours, I really want to start thinking about what you all think the effect would be. So imagine what I'm going to do is I'm going to input in here. I'm going to actually, excuse me, somebody is calling me. That is not helpful right now. Um, uh, in a minute, I'm going to input 15% as your suggestion, and I'm going to input a much higher maximum. So let's just go with that one that's low, and then we'll try a, a higher one later. Excuse me. Um, so 15% is what you put in here. The way you do that is you just go to this little box as Sabelle laid out, 15. We'll keep it at this 50% as the maximum. And then you're able to just hit the tab function or look at, I'm moving the little dot here. It goes down to eight. It can go up to 25, 26. I'll put 15, which is the number here in the middle. And as you move the dot, the scenario is gonna recalculate all of the equations in the model and play out the resulting scenario. Now, the first thing you ought to do when you make a change like this in the model, you want to make sure the model's doing what you would expect it to do. So, I just said 15% at two degrees. Well, let's go make sure it's doing what you thought. What year do we hit two degrees? So, let's go find out, make sure it's confirmed it's doing what you thought. So, here we are, 2052. I'm looking and my cursor is touching each of the years. 2050 was 2.1. 2049, no, it's about 2050. Let's see, that's still calling on the, the business as usual. Seems to be about 2049. 2049 is the year that it hits two degrees. So over here in Gross World Product, let's go look at 2049 in the business as usual run is 301. 2049 in the new run is 248. There's a difference there of 53. So you want to check, just do some common sense math. Is this doing what you hoped it would do? So common sense math, 53, it's a reduction of $53 trillion a year below 301. So 53, I'm going to do 53 divided by 301 equals about 15%. We're getting the result, actually 17%, it was a little higher. Let's look and see here in the result. There's another way that does that calculation. And where is it? We're gonna look and see the graph, which is the reduction in GDP from climate impacts here in 2048, 2049, and 16%, 15, let me see, actually right in that period of time, Yes, it is getting us the reduction in GDP from climate impacts that we imagined. Okay, we've confirmed it's doing that, and that gives us really the first result that we were curious about. What might be our quantification of the future impacts? And in 2048, how many trillion dollars a year? In this case, it was $53 trillion a year lower. The second thing that we really want to explore is how would we simulate the different impacts from the research literature? I'm going to go down here to the result, excuse me, to this assumption, and I'm going to pull up the graph that I really like in this case. It is reduction of GDP on temperature. I'm going to reset this to where we were before, and you can see that you can pull up several of the presets that we saw before. Here comes Nordhaus. Watch the blue line right here rise from zero up to the, follow the red line of Nordhaus. Um, we can then test out, in this case, um, Dietz and Howard, Howard Stern, not Howard Stern, Mikulitz Stern, Dietz and Stern. I'm going to change the preset to Dietz and Stern. So watch the blue line. It's going to jump up to reach the golden or yellow line and then replicate that result. If we had the function, the damage function, then we would see gross world product grow and grow and grow and follow the blue line and start to balance out in the 2060s, 2070s, 2080s. We can also try, of course, the others like Weitzman. We can try Burke, which shows you earlier damage, but not as much in the longer term. All right, what we thought we would do next is to think a little bit more about the impact if it was a stronger function. I told you at the start that we had a, a meeting with a US leader who thought that the function 
would be a lot stronger than what we've explored here. And several of you thought it was possible to have a more a stronger impact. The, the highest impact in the literature, if you look here at this gray area, this is the Burke at all range. Do you see this gray area? It goes from the bottom here all the way to the top line here that shows you, as Sabelle mentioned, at two degrees up to 35% with a maximum of around 75 percent so 35 and 75. so imagine if if we had a function which was the strongest that's shown in these academic studies what do you think temperature would be in 2100 i'm setting it up so if we had a function that had a, at two degrees a 35 percent reduction in gdp with a maximum of 75. What do you think this scenario's 2100 temperature will be after adding this effect? What do you think? So the first vote is under two degrees. Here come the other votes. So what you're doing is you're simulating your mental model. Simulate your mental model. What do you think the impact will be if we have this function in the model? Basically, how much warming would the impact of climate change avoid? Clearly, it's not how we want to, want to avoid warming in the future. However, how do you think that feedback loop is likely to play out over time? Most votes are coming in at 2.5 to 2.9. 2.5 to 2.9 is getting most of the suggest most of the guesses. Pretty strong winner right now, 2.5 to 2.9. 2 to 2.4. Some people think, some people think it will actually not solve, it will keep us below two degrees because of the strong effect of climate back on economic growth. So 2.5 to 2.9 seems to be where most votes are. All right, let's go over here and try it. We're gonna go back to the simulator. We're going to reset. Um, and here, I'm gonna pull it back up. The economic impact of climate change. What did I say? I said 35, and then I said 75 as the other effect. And there is the resulting function: 35% here, a maximum of 75 here. The result is that gross world product would peak around the 2040s and fall if there was this impact. Watching it go through the chain that I showed you before. Energy consumption would peak and fall. Um, emissions of greenhouse gases and energy use would peak and fall. We'd see overall temperature uh, emissions of greenhouse gases peak around 2030s, fall steadily, and then it would deliver about 2.7 degrees. We're going to take a look and see. You guys were. Wow, right on, right in the middle of where most of you voted, 2.7 degrees. All right, so this, of course, should not be relieving at all. This is not a way to prevent future warming that we would want. We need to explore, look in the model and see what is actually happening around the world. And the most telling graph here, I think, would be exploring GDP per capita by region that shows that some of the increase of wealth, particularly in the developing world, India, China, other developing in gold, in this light Carolina blue, in the dark blue of other developing, the economic development that could lift many people out of poverty gets going but never really takes off. We see the significant impact, particularly in the developing world, but actually all around the world, of the effects of climate change. And so, it, John, you're on the call right now. I remember you quoting someone else as saying that um, cancer cures smoking. And of course, that is not a morally responsible way for anyone to think about how we address the problems that we see in the world. In the same way, we don't want the impacts of climate change to cure climate change by driving uh, lower economic growth and therefore less energy demand. Of course, what we really want to explore, and we can do this with the simulator, is all of the many things that we know about in the world 
that do it the way that would be much better, such as with energy efficiency and a carbon price and more renewables and less coal and less deforestation, reduced methane, maybe some seed carbon removal, growing some trees, the kind of things that are an active way to decarbonize and to reduce overall energy use to get us well below two degrees. So stepping back, there's the function, there's the result that we just saw from um, playing out that feedback loop over time. So I wanna just pause for a second. We've gone through and explained some of the um, impacts and really send it back to you to make sure that you have a chance to try this out yourself. So Caroline, if you would send the link, um, please go ahead and send the link to the model and make sure people have access to it and can look at it themselves. And some of the other resources, you heard Sabelle explain everything uh, in the model, but the other resource, and if Caroline, maybe after that, sending the link, you could send this recent blog post. So if you really were interested and wanna get the, the written version of what you just heard, please go to this blog post. And if you could send the link in chat, here is uh, her blog post that explains all the assumptions, how to use this function. It's laid out really well here if you'd like to learn more about it. We also sent you a link to the reference guide, which has a long explanation of the equations behind it. Additionally, if there are questions that aren't answered there, if you click right here on support, it sends you over to the support section where we have many, excuse me, this is uh, many FAQs, and you can also log a question to us and our support team will answer any of your questions. So, pausing for a second, um, and I really welcome some of these questions might be best for Sabelle. Um, actually, at this point, before questions, John, if you're still with us, um, anything you want to add? You just heard how we explained this, but you helped really shape this function. Uh, anything you would add that you think is important for people to note? One note, we do have some more information about um, social cost of carbon that we can share here, if that would be helpful. But um, John, anything you would like to add uh, about the damage function that we didn't just go. Uh, okay. All yeah. right, well, one thing he would say is we're excited to take these calculations and connect it to um, the social cost of carbon. This is a calculation that in government ministries and around in businesses, we think of a way to sum up the potential future damages of climate change to assess how much money should we spend today to avoid those damages. It really comes up in, in nature. Just recently, there was a paper written about the priorities for calculating the social cost of carbon. The Biden administration here in the US is setting a social cost of carbon. So we're trying to calculate what it would be in En-ROADS under a range of assumptions. And we're starting to come up with some of these graphs that show you what the academic literature says about the social cost of carbon, and then also what it would be over time, and just other assumptions such as that. So know that we're planning to add that. The other thing, and kind of based on what we heard this morning, and I'm just to get ahead of some of the questions, there are other feedback loops that are not in En-ROADS yet. We would love them to be on En-ROADS, and you're probably thinking of some of them. So connections that we have not included yet, that are in the real world that are not in our simulation. One of them is from the impacts of climate change back to the inability or ability to invest in solutions. If we don't have money in the future, it's difficult to build the renewable energy that we need. It's difficult to spend money on the retrofitting for energy efficiency that we need. That link is not yet in the model. The second is that there are economic growth benefits and co-benefits besides to addressing equity but ones to just a straight up economic growth from jobs in renewable energy, jobs in retrofitting and in energy efficiency, et cetera. Positive benefits from taking these actions that we capture as part of what we call multi-solving. Go to our website to read about a lot of the examples around the world. In fact, we have a whole database called GREAT that Cassandra, you're on the call right now that you're pulling together concrete examples of these benefits. But that is a link that could be in the model, but it is not. The other is carbon price. If we set a carbon price, how would that affect economic growth? So 
three big things that are not in the model. Um, that said, what uh, what questions do you have? What are you seeing that are coming up? Anyone on our team? First, any written questions that uh, are relevant to Sabelle or me or the team? So, uh, Yazzie, Travis, Caroline. Any yeah. Any questions that have come up? Yeah. We're getting some good ones. I'm just reading through them because I think a lot of them do. There are questions about things that are not included. Um, I see one that's popping up about using this function. I yeah. see Laura, you're asking, what's the best audience to show this to? So in our experience, this is most relevant when somebody brings it up. It, it isn't like, welcome everybody, let's talk about climate change, here's the damage function. Um, the main purpose of En-ROADS is to get people to sit down and explore the actions that are necessary to create the future that people really want, to help them see where the leverage is, where the leverage is not. Um, and you want to direct people there. However, we have found that some people come in, they see that there's no feedback, and then they go, uh, I'm not with you. I don't think we can do this without that connection. So for someone who's in that mode, add a damage function and just leave it there and say, okay, even if that's part of this world, now let's talk about carbon price. Let's talk about agriculture. Let's talk about all the different issues of, of things that are important. So bring it up secondarily. Don't lead with it, but it's important to know that it's there and use it when you need it. Yes, the other that you see, others that you see. Yeah, so there's a question for either you or Sibel, but uh, about if there seems to be across these kind of widely varying models about the damage function, is is has there been any consensus or are we starting to see any consensus on these, at least within certain sub-communities? This or is are a really allied? good, yeah, this is a good question for Sibel. Sibel, are we starting to see consensus? Are all those studies do people react and say start converging on a shared vision uh i think this is a very political question and i don't know if i can give a politically correct answer so my observation is that so we talked to a couple of scientists uh, who work on this continuously who are really experts on this subject it looks like scientific community converges to higher estimates like work we showed. Uh, while converge, there is so much diversity. I, I think maybe we cannot say converge and consensus yet. Uh, but scientific community is in favor of higher estimates. Uh, but political numbers like the latest social cost of carbon estimate the US administration has announced aligns with uh, lower estimates like North House. So, <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, scientists high, politicians low. Is that a fair summary, Sibel? I think so, yes. Yeah. Great. Other questions? Yeah, there's a question. I've seen a few similar ones of if this damage function takes into account any additional health costs due to temperature increase. Sibel, does this include health costs due to temperature increase? Again, I would like to give accurate answers. I cannot say one by one, but because it depends on how these economists estimated their functions. Yet, Burke, for example, has the healthcare cost and um, also the personal productivity cost. There are things that they don't include yet. For instance, they don't include the damage on the natural capital, like the biodiversity loss, because no one knows yet what they might cost. However, they include the damage in the different sectors like healthcare, agriculture, infrastructure, etc. Great. Thank you. Other questions, Yazi? Yeah, so 
a question about if or how this damage function feature in En-ROADS has been received by policymakers. I know you spoke a little bit about it at the beginning, but how could some of the facilitators on the call use this for right. presenting to their policymakers? Yeah. yeah, thank you. So the short answer is we haven't presented this to almost anybody in the policymaking world because this is our launch of it. We just finished it. We're just sharing it. This is your reactions are some of our first reactions at all. So uh, maybe type in the chat what you think, because this is the first of it we've heard. And again, the answer is uh, how to use it. Respond to where people's curiosity is. Follow their curiosity. Um, and you may use this or you may not. Maybe one more question, and then I'd like to give you some more of the resources that are available to you before we wrap up at three. Um, and also, we are gonna stick around afterwards for more of the questions and follow up. So uh, one more question, if you would, Yazzie. Sure, uh, just cause we've been seeing this question a lot and we get this also for the bigger En-ROADS model, but if it's possible to adjust or calculate the damage function at any sub-regional levels. Great, what a good question. And the answer is no. Uh, we don't know how to do that. We have done this globally, and we're really sticking to our global focus with this model. There are some excellent models that are out there that are exploring regional dynamics, but uh, En-ROADS isn't one of them. All right, so I want to guide you towards uh, a little bit of what we really encourage you all to do with some of this information is, here's En-ROADS, and many of you, we see we're so happy to see our En-ROADS Climate Ambassadors on the call here. And if you haven't become one and you really like En-ROADS, some of your best um, way to become an ambassador, excuse me, I'm searching for En-ROADS Climate Ambassadors. Uh, what we're doing is training people around the world to become what we call an En-ROADS Climate Ambassador. That is to go through our eight part training series and all the information is here, maybe Yes, you're Caroline, if you can send it to everybody, um, a, uh, the link to this page. We have 284 people around the world, 47 countries, who have engaged 47,000 people with En-ROADS. Here are many of them, and you would be part of taking the training course, joining this community, practicing and sharing this around the world. So we really hope that you could use the simulator in education, in business, in policy making, in your research. Um, and the best way to do that is to, be, is to join this group of people. Um, and all of the materials are, of course, online here, the workshop, uh, the game. And in fact, we're going to be running on April 15th, a very large game where people play the roles of leaders around the world. Someone playing the role of Rex Tillerson from Exxon Mobil, big oil company. Someone playing the role of Greta Thunberg, the climate activist, and Xi Jinping from China, and the minister from Brazil and the land management. Play the roles of people and negotiate a way to get down below two degrees. Uh, so we'll be running that on April 15th. Send us a note here if you'd like to get the invitation to it. But this is another one of the forms that En-ROADS takes, is this game that uh, is a powerful way to engage people. Another form, of course, is not just the game, but uh, En-ROAD Climate Workshop. And there's materials here about how to engage other people with a broad look at how we're gonna address climate change, thinking globally and then acting locally in whatever area, whether it's a neighborhood, a city, a state, a business, a region, a country, or if you wanna think about the whole world. Um, a way to engage other people. And we run this workshop, of course, every month. Uh, sometimes we have a twist like we did this week where we're adding more about the damage function. Yazzie, anything else you would add for other resources or opportunities that you think would be helpful for people to know about? Um, we've gotten a few requests about uh, the slides that you've used today and people would love to have those yeah. to be able to explain it to some of their participants. Remind me, Yazzie, what's the best way, maybe just tell everybody the the best way to get the slides. I am not remembering exactly how we tend to post them. 
Sure. So usually with these types of webinars, you'll receive a follow-up email in about an hour. And it's difficult for us to attach the slides directly in that email. But if you respond to that email, we'll be able to send you a copy of those slides. Great. All right. Well, wrapping up the 60 minutes, it's been quite a journey today. We've shown you how we have been modeling and simulating the climate system without the damage function. And hopefully you see the need for it. We need to understand what is the likely economic damage at a global scale to the economy. And we really ought to think about the feedback loop that gets created. We've shown you a bit of the survey of the literature that's out there and then how we took that economic literature, incorporated it into a system dynamics model to give you the capacity to, for yourself, but also with other people, test and improve your mental model about the dynamics of this important complex system. We hope this is empowering to you as you engage whoever you can to do all we can do to address this challenge. Um, overall, engaging people and getting us on the right track to prevent the most significant impacts of climate change and address climate-related equity along the way. Overall, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it. So go get them and do stick around if you want to uh, ask more questions or hear answers to more questions. All right. Bye-bye. Okay, we're back to answer some more questions where uh, usually people will uh, have a few more. Yazzie, are you seeing more that, that they should, we should answer or are they mostly ones to send us support or get handled in the question box? What, what are you seeing? Yeah, they're definitely quite varying. So if we don't get to your question today, please feel free to just send us a, an email by visiting our support platform at support.climate interactive.org. Um, one of the questions or kind of concerns that we've that has come up a bit is just the variability of the different studies and, and yeah. how people should kind of know which one to pick when they're talking about it or, or using the damage function yeah. feature. Yeah. Uh, boy, this is a hard question. Um, Sabelle, do you have any wisdom about this one yeah i can say some wise words i can say don't be afraid of the uncertainty but just embrace it uh yes this various estimates different functions shows us that there is still a wide uncertainty and this is unavoidable because it's about future we cannot predict the future we cannot foresee the future however the goal of this feature on n roads is to let you test different assumptions and test explore different possibilities po different yeah. possible realizations of this, this uncertainty so these functions from the literature four lines we show here you can take them as a guidance this is what scientists are saying and based on this you can test different mental models different assumptions and different yeah. possibilities so that's very wise yeah. too much from this is very wise. Listen to it, really take in what Dr. Ecker just said. It's very wise about the purpose of En-ROADS. The purpose of En-ROADS is not to choose the right function to create the quote unquote right prediction of the future. We're not in that game. Other models, like the IEA is really endeavoring to make forecasts. The International Energy Agency and their World Energy Outlook they choose, they want to make a proper forecast. That is their one of their goals. Our mission with En-ROADS is to improve the understanding of policymakers, of students, of you and me and everybody. Our goal is to improve the mental models, the thinking of everybody. As such, what's most important is for you to incorporate the wisdom of the model into your own head. The fact that, okay, let's say it is closer to Burke. What kind of impact it has early. It has a bigger impact early and less of an impact later. 
it reduces at 0.2 degrees. Dietz and Stern is very different. Less of an impact early, more of an impact later, less of an overall impact. That could teach you something like, well, wait, maybe what matters the most is the strength of the impact between 1.5 and 2, like the early stage of warming and the impact, that has a bigger impact on temperature. Whereas if it's low early and then later gets higher, it has less of an impact. Those kinds of insights is why we're here, to improve your metal model more than have the quote unquote right forecast. Now mind you, we wanna get this as close as possible to what is the best damage function, but that's not our purpose. Great question to bring up. Others that you see? Yeah, just scrolling through some really great questions here. Many of them are, are quite detailed and specific, and I think a lot of questions too are focused on the studies themselves and less on their integration into En-ROADS. So perhaps- and, and one note just about that, I don't know if I showed you, I didn't show you this, like on the studies themselves, click on the, the panel here, and underneath, we added links to the actual studies themselves. So I just clicked on Weitzman, and then boom, here is the paper on which uh, we based that assumption. And so you can go and look at all of them. But I, I kind of cut you off there, Yazzie, keep going. No, that's okay. I think that will be really helpful for people because I think that's exactly what people are looking oh, for and trying to understand some of the assumptions made in well, each of the studies. So I think that's great. Here's Nordhaus's paper, and they're all right here. Go check them out. Others that you're seeing? Um, not many, a lot of people, which is always great to hear, and I think we'll take these notes for future future requests but are hoping to have more and more included within yeah. something like the damage function yeah. which i think at the moment is not included i'm getting a question from our friend florian kottmeyer in stuttgart um any sequence you suggest to show the different damage functions to get a good storyline curve in workshops or the climate action simulation Climate action simulation is our game. So how would we, any sequence to show uh, in the workshop or the game, like Florian and everybody, I think I'll say again what I, I said before that I think of this in the main workshops that we run, where you're trying to engage people towards action on climate. This is a function to keep, as I say, in your back pocket to the side and ready in case it's needed. It is not something to lead with. It is not something to push or propose because it diverts the framing of a conversation away from action. When you run a workshop or a game, we want the energy and the conversation to be, what shall we do now? What is the best thing to do now? Now, while thinking deeply about it, but oriented towards policy in action. Now, if someone is stuck and they can't think about renewable energy or a carbon price or deforestation or agriculture because they don't see you incorporating the effects of climate change back on economic growth, then you need to take the time, explain these different functions and go there. But don't choose to go there because it isn't a conversation that leads to people taking bold and effective action in the near term to address this problem. There's a real threat here to get caught up in intellectual academic thinking about the issue, studying the issue versus the purpose of En-ROADS, which is to drive effective action in the near term. Not hasty action, but effective action. So don't bring it up is my suggestion. Other questions that you're seeing that seem relevant to everybody? Um, just looking through these here, uh, which Laura is asking a, a great question, which is uh, something I think you've alluded to a little bit too, but uh, the possibility of 
incorporating some combination of these as it, in the En-ROADS baseline as opposed to having it as an assumption and, and the difference yeah. between those? So, <laughs> the question of do we incorporate this in the baseline? And we're having a debate with John Sturman, you just saw, and Sabelle, we're all wondering, should we incorporate any of these functions into the baseline? Um, and so far we have said no, because we don't have enough confidence that the academic community and just the overall world has converged on what an appropriate function would be. So we're not putting it in, and we won't put it in probably for at least many months, because we don't have that confidence that uh, we're clear enough about what it should be. That said, I said it this morning, but um, we don't know exactly what the damage function is. The one thing we know that it is not is zero. Like the most wrong thing, unfortunately, is what we have in there right now, which is this. Watch that blue line go back down to zero. We know this is the only wrong thing. However, we don't know what would be an appropriate, acceptable to everybody uh, setting. And so we haven't put it in yet. There is a decent argument to say, well, add a very modest one, add Nordhaus, and just go in here and say, all right, we're going to put in a very weak one. It doesn't even change the temperature. It just shows that there is a modest effect. So we could consider doing that. Um, but we aren't yet. If you have a, if you think we should, please write in and we'll consider your argument. Um, Tamara Ledley, I see you. Tamara from MIT, you had a good question. Where can we find this graph? There are two good ways to get to this graph. One of them is here under assumptions. You go to the function itself and it says related graphs. And this one is called reduction in GDP versus temperature. So click right there. Another one is in the overall list of all of the graphs. If you click on any of these titles, you see you get the list of the graphs. It's under impacts. So look under impacts, scroll down reduction in GDP versus temperature. There it is, camera. Other questions that anybody sees, what shall we, what else shall we talk about? What made you change the baseline version from four down to 3.6 and why? So we have a really great webinar, a full hour, Gabriel, on why we did that. And Yazzie or Caroline or somebody, can you send the link to that webinar? Um, I think we have it saved somewhere. Um, and the short version is that renewable energy, wind and solar, Gabriel, is growing a lot faster than we thought it was. Secondly, we've noticed that uh, some of the measures of historical temperature change have actually changed, and we changed the year against which we made our reference uh, we change the, the year, when we, excuse me, when we talk about temperature increase from pre-industrial times, we change the definition of pre-industrial from the 1850s to the 1750s to be consistent with how much of the um, temperatures are measured. And that changed things as well. And there was another change as well, internal. But the main thing was the huge growth of wind and solar that has big implications for keeping uh, particularly gas and coal on the ground in the future. Other questions? Um, maybe we're running out of... Ooh, this is a good one. Andreas, does the damage function impact all energy sources equally? Andreas, I haven't heard that. Does it affect them all? Well, let's do a little experiment. How would we determine, does it? So you could go do this, Andreas. Here's how you would set up such a test, is you would go say, pull up. First of all, run your mental model. Do we think it's gonna affect coal, oil, gas, and renewables the same? If there's less energy demand, will they all go down about the same amount, or will they go down differently? 
and consider that the reason that you're getting investments in different energy supp supplies is relative to how attractive they are, which is largely driven by how much they cost. So on the electricity side, for example, what happens is a function of what their relative attractiveness is, and that driven by their cost. So this is out largely, it's gonna really kick in in the 2040s, and at that point, wind and solar is very attractive. Coal is still kind of cheap. There's natural gas. There's, uh, and you think if we have less demand, which of these loses the most out into the future? Let's think. And now let's go look. So uh, why don't we just go back to the base settings? I'm going to go pull up. Um, Actually, let's stay there with what we just had. Reduction in GDP versus temperature. Over on the left, um, the way we would do that experiment is we go here to simulation, assumptions, economic impact, and then let's choose a strong effect in the nearer term like Burke. So I'm going to go and choose. First, we're going to undo this because we're already set at Nordhaus. We go back to zero effect. Then we're gonna choose, excuse me, Burke. Okay, we just saw a change. Replay the change. Okay, you see the wedges changing? They're all changing, but it's kind of hard to see the difference in each of them. So what you need to do is you would need to go look and see what is the individual effect. Here is the relative impact on coal. So a good bit less coal. Let's see if it's about the same. And we could, of course, quantify this more exactly, but just by eyeballing it, oil, kind of similarly, I don't know, it, maybe it's a little bit less percentage-wise. What is that, a 15%, 20% drop by 2040? Now let's look at natural gas. Seems like a little less than the effect on coal. Renewables, I'm gonna go to renewable energy a little bit less. So looks like renewable energy didn't take as much of a hit in exajoules, maybe about the same percentage wise. Boy, when you eyeball it, they look pretty similar, Andreas. I don't see a huge uh, different, different impact. It's nothing like, like when you put a carbon price, coal gets hit a lot more than some of the other things. But this reduces overall energy demand and it looks like all of the energy supplies seem to take kind of a similar 10 to 15 percent cut uh, in their overall uh, consumption. There's a quick answer, but if you really want to get serious about it, you know you could go do the specific math, Andreas. Click on this button right here that copies your data, and you can go over here to Excel and go write a paper about it. The damage function and its effect and the use of different energies by Andreas. Go write it and uh, so here what you would do is if you're going to make that, um, of course you take the data, paste it in here, do an analysis, what is the percentage drop and see what it is. Write a paper, write a blog post, we'd always be, we'd be really interested in what you come up with. Um, okay, so maybe that's enough. It's 20 minutes past. We've answered a lot of questions. Others, please do go to our support site and ask some questions there. All right, we're going to wrap this up. Just want to thank again our amazing team. We had Sabelle with the presentation, and then we also had Travis and Caroline and Yazzie and Cassandra, John and Skook, probably others that I didn't even see, helping you get the most out of this and answering questions, but also building the model that you see here and building the interface, building all the support material, the team that really makes all of this work come together. Thank you very much. Hope you can use this to make a big difference. Bye-bye.